explain to the folks how you would deal with a uh, in a summons to appear for a credit card debt or any kind of debt. Let's just do that. Let's make it blanket. What would you do if somebody claims that you own a debt? And how would you proceed? Because you're doing it exactly like everybody does. So, uh, so I, well, first of all, it's not a summons to appear because we're still in uh, the private going back and forth. From the beginning, you know, you're already jumping all the way to a summons to appear. I ain't going to go there. First thing that happens is guy sends me a letter and says, you owe me this money, pay it. I go, okay, who are you? I want to find out who you are and, and validate the fact that we have a, a relationship and find out if there's actually a, a deal or a contract or if there was anything made or if it's just some crazy son of a gun from Arkansas trying to, like, uh, you know, collect money from some poor guy in Chicago. So anyway, uh, after you get that settled, you go, okay, I guess we really do know each other and I guess we really do have some kind of a deal. So what's your claim? All right, well, I think you owe me $147.25. Okay, for what? Well, stuff. I don't know. Stuff. What stuff? Okay, well, you know what? You know, that's great. But why don't you just give me a validation? Why don't you send me, like, an itemized true bill or a bill of particulars that says this is a deal and this is what happened? Okay. And by the way, why don't you include a copy of the contract if there is one? All right. So time goes, and uh, you get something which is on the order of uh, we don't care what you want. You're going to pay this anyway. Then you go back and say, okay, well, I believe you're a franchisee of the federal government and the banking system, which means you have to follow certain rules of RESPA and TILA and everything else. If it's, if it's residential mortgage, it'd be RESPA. If it's uh, credit card stuff, and that'd be TILA. And so, you know, you got to you got to jump through these hoops. You know, that's you know, you might win at the end, but the federal government at least gives me the opportunity to put these barrel hoops up in front of you, so I can watch you jump through them before you take my money. So I can at least be entertained for the money I'm about to pay. You know, why, uh, you know, why have to pay something to somebody for, without entertainment? So you gotta <laughs> jump through hoops. But if they refuse to jump through those hoops, then you can go, aha, we've caught you because the federal government said for you to keep in good standing with your franchise, you have to be able to do those barrel hoop jumps. And Greg asked you to do that and you didn't, so you're a bad boy. Now, I've got a cause that I can go after him and say, you know, Here's your last chance to jump through those barrel hoops. you got to prove all this stuff. And let's say, um, obviously, if they don't perform, then that becomes an actual justifiable claim to say, I don't have to pay anything. All right? But let's say, just for the hell of it, that uh, he does perform. He's the one in one million creditor who goes, you know, I totally understand the rules, and I'm not going to be a poop head, so here's all the stuff I got. And you go, holy shit, this guy actually gave it to me. Wow, that's kind of cool. But it saves a look at it. And then you go, okay, this, 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 this. Okay, uh, do you have firsthand knowledge that I actually did these charges? Do you actually know that I did all these things? Um, do you have anybody that are witness that I'll do that? Or is this just stuff that showed up on the record and uh, went unrebutted because uh, I didn't know and you didn't know, but now you decided to collect on this and, you know, hey, maybe we were maybe we're dealing with an alien using credit card dumpers. Who knows? Or somebody down in Arkansas trying to steal money from you. Who knows? So anyway, you can play all this game and you can go back and forth. And in a worst case scenario, if you decide to acquiesce and say, Okay, I owe you money, you say I'll give you a dollar a month and he'll go, No, you that's not acceptable. I'll say, I'll give you a dollar fifty a month. Oh, that's not acceptable. So well that's all I got. And you can say, Sue me takes you to court, you bring you document, all that stuff, you go to court, and you tell the judge, look, I, in good faith, offered this guy. Matter of fact, I sent him a check for this and this, and he either cashed it or sent it back to me, and he refuses to deal with the fact that I've got, uh, you know, a hardship situation here, and I was trying to stand in good standing with him, but uh, he's just being a poop, and the judge will throw the book at the guy for, you know, not being honorable and uh, accepting your best effort, and uh, that's usually what happens. Nobody ever or rarely ever throws the book at you if you've actually got a, a history and recorded piece of data that says a recorded record. I'm being redundant to say a recorded record, but information on the record that uh, that indicates that you are actually operating in good faith to the best of your ability because you can't get blood out of a turnip. And uh, if uh, you can prove that in the statutory court, you can actually win. Uh, Carl's got a great case of a guy getting a sulfur for nothing. 
because the, the creditor was being a poop head. And uh, so that can happen. You can win in your favor. Or if it's in equity, of course, the judge could come up with some kind of a compromise. You know, say, okay, you know, you know on, on, on alternate months, do this, do that, and the other guy does this and that. And if you're in equity, just say, okay, thanks a lot, sir. Have a nice day. Um, if you actual, absolutely want to dispute the claim, um, then you can try to, you know, challenge the contract as to whether or not it's valid. Uh, you can challenge the law as to whether or not there's any law that says you have to pay them. You can challenge a bunch of other things. But um, after that, uh, you start going into more esoteric stuff that some people do. Um, some people actually challenge whether or not the uh, currency is valid or if everything is already prepaid using your birth certificate bond, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's, like, from that point, you can branch into, like, 12 other things that people do. So that's typically the scenario that people run into when they get popped on some kind of a credit card debt. And uh, I'll leave it at that, and that's kind of like the overview. So, Kyle, what do you think? That, that was great. He kind of slammed it there pretty quickly. Um, what me and Greg were talking about earlier, um, we were just basically saying step by step how you do it in court. And like I said, like I said, Greg went through this just like lightning just now. And um, all we were basically trying to say earlier was that uh, my method is just to say uh, when you when you're being summoned to appear, you did everything on the private side. All you have to all you have to say to the folks is, I just need to see the law before the court. That's all you need to do. But like Greg was trying to say, and I'll try to do it a little bit. Greg was saying is first you make sure that there's joinder between the parties. First you make sure that you know each other. That somebody's not just moving a claim or a debt in front of you in error. It might be just a mistake. The same spelling of the name, whatever. The next thing you just need to do is then you just say to friends, just bring forth the obligation of the debt. Just show proof of the obligation of the debt. Say, you know what, honestly, I don't remember you. Honestly, I don't remember having any business dealings with you. Or you could say, honestly, I don't remember that number being that exact amount. You go, uh, how, and like I said, everybody knows you can look into your local uh, state courts, uh, the rules of the courts, or you guys code uh, the code of Idaho, you, you state codes sections. Oh, cool. I just I just remembered, uh, Carl. Here's a real world scenario. My friend Brian, um, he got a bill from a credit card company that said they wanted like two hundred and something dollars, and this is a credit card that he canceled in about 1996, and he's not used it since then. It was an early thing that he had, and he hasn't used it. And so some debt collector got a hold of this account and put this stuff together. And because he did have that account at one time and he remembered it, they were counting on him to just go, oh, crap, I forgot that, and, and pay them. And he challenged them, told them to go to hell, and they went away. All right. So <laughs> that, 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 what, what I'm saying is, uh, yeah, let me, let, me, uh, <laughs> let me go back to what I was saying there, Greg. All I'm saying is, first, you want to make sure that there's no error. Make sure that there's there's nothing in dispute. Make sure that uh, you you know. Uh, first, you want to make sure you try to settle on a private side. It's like say, well, I have receipts that I, I paid you off. Maybe uh, it's a computer glitch or a computer error. Maybe somebody who did data entry for your company uh, failed to um, uh, put this information in. So let me give it resend the information. You know, I'll verify that it's uh, true and accurate, and I'll show you cancel checks, whatever it is, to try to help your folks. <laughs> Um, try to help you folks um, uh, understand that, that this, this matter has been settled. So like I said, the only other thing you could do is because every state code book has provisions within their code that if you're chartered as a business and you operate as a, like a, a, under a license in your state, you have to abide by state codes. You can't just wing this and say this is a private uh, fair, or this is a private matter, or this is a private business. You have to. You are now in the public when you're engaging with others. You know, in the public. So all you're doing is, like I said, it's called statute of frauds. So a statute of fraud means that every single agreement that you folks did, and it started back in uh, the 1600s, because it uh, actually it was started in 1677. 
paper and pen became plentiful and cheap, and they weren't writing on sheepskins anymore. They, you could use, actually, you know, they used, you know, cheap materials to write things on. And the people were starting to get educated by 1677. So any businessman was demanded of them to have it written in, in form of paper, parchment, sort of contract. It had to be written out, spelled out, only to certain, um, under certain uh, transfers of certain properties or possessions had to be itemized and had to be listed. Like, say you went to McDonald's and you went to the drive-in and you ordered $499 worth of hat. By the time you get to uh, the window, if you changed your mind and you didn't want those $499 worth of Happy Meals, you could just say, um, I changed my mind. Oh, what, what Happy Meals? I didn't order any Happy Meals. I ordered a Big Mac to go. And the lady at the window can't call the police on you and say that you failed to you know, pay for the services because it's he said and she said under a certain dollar amount. But over $500, what the lady at McDonald's is supposed to do in almost every state code is go outside, find out who just made a place this order, write some sort of a contract saying, you will pay me $500 for these hamburgers. And uh, that way, if you do not pay the $500, you are now bound, and I will take you to court, and I will definitely win. So that's what the statutes of large means. So when there's a certain dollar amount, um, it's all he said, she said. And if you're a businessman like McDonald's and somebody orders $1,500, $501 worth of Happy Meals and then the guy pulls up, there's a couple of crazy kids, college kids made this ridiculous order, and they pull in to um, up to the, to the window and they don't pay, McDonald's has to eat it if they don't have a contract that's worth $500, if they, don't, if they couldn't prove it. So that's where the statute of large is. So if you folks actually want to learn um, like what what the statutes of large actually um, um, bind is like is like a marriage has to be in writing, you know, in your state codes. Uh, any contract that's going to take to perform a service more than one year, or a transfer of land needs to be in writing, or a um, seeing an executor of an estate like you're creating a will or a trust that has to be in writing. So there's no he said she said stuff, or like a sale of something over like a certain amount of money. So um, there's, there's uh, certain conditions that must be in writing to hold in court when you're dealing with a credit card company, a mortgage company, Macy's, McDonald's, a taxi driver, a hotel, anything. Under $500, basically, you get into court and do this arguing, he said, she said nonsense. Over $500, if the person that's moving a claim against you, like a credit card company or a hotel or a taxi driver or McDonald's, does not have it in writing, they're going to lose because they are to know that according to the code in which they're chartered and licensed to operate on that, if they want to make a claim for anything over $500, they better be in writing and it better be signed because I helped somebody get out of a, he said, she said nonsense because a person who was making a claim against them wanted $1,500 in compensation. And I told the lady, she said, hey, you know, settle work on a private side. And the guy said, the lady, F you. I'm not settling for anything less but 1500 so all I said to the lady is, okay, hang on a second. I've got the code of Virginia. I want to pop it up. You're going to hand it to the judge, and the judge is going to say a simple thing to the man. Do you have this agreement between this and you, this, you, you the man, who's a state-licensed uh, surveyor, and this woman, do you have it before this court? Do you have the law, the contract, the law? Do you have the law before the court? And the man said, no, this is all verbal. And then the judge just said, case dismissed. And when the court thing was over, I tried to still work with the land surveyor, but he was extremely upset. And all I was trying to tell him was, like, look, she'll still work with you on a private side. He was furious. And um, he didn't want to hear anything. Because I tried to tell him, look, if it's over a certain amount of money, you are licensed to be a land surveyor in the Commonwealth, and you have to abide by certain rules. Now, if it's $499, it's basically he said, she said, and the judge probably would have tossed it to you. Because why else would have you been on that woman's land. There must be some sort of an agreement where you wouldn't have appeared. So there is some sort of a contract, an unwritten contract, an unwritten law, because it's self-evident that there's no reason in the world you just go hop on this lady's property and just start surveying nilly-willy. So this lady's like, yes, he, uh, he did survey the land, but we agreed on a less of a price. And she was like, I'm willing to pay you this, but I'm not willing to pay you that. 
So uh, the judge threw that case out on a poor land surveyor guy. So like I said, that's, that's what I'm trying to explain to you folks, that when certain companies come after you, it's all he said, she said, up to a certain amount. The same thing with a marriage. Just because that woman points a finger across that courtroom and says, you're married, um, according to the state codes, they're going to say, do you have it in writing somewhere, ma'am? Because if the man says, I've never seen that woman in my life, that is not my child. I mean, before, you know, before people were able to do a DNA test to prove those weren't your children, some woman could just walk into a courtroom and say, that man, this is his baby. And I got 50 and 9 witnesses behind me to say so that it's true. So uh, it's just got, you know, a little dicey for, like, somebody who's rich or well-to-do who just won a lottery. All of a sudden, somebody's claiming them that they're their daddy. So, uh, like I said, that's why things, certain things, you know, should be and must be put in writing, you know, for, for everybody's safety. It's not just for, you know, being sued, but the person who wants to do the suing. The land surveyor got, you know, flat out nothing in for his labor. So he should have put it in writing and had the lady sign it that she's willing to pay $750 or $1,500 or whatever they, their agreement was. So let me just explain to you statutes at large. Statutes at large is a you know, very important concept when you're dealing with any kind of a relationship. I don't care if it's credit card. I'm just trying to make a blank generalization for anything that you folks might run into out there, not just one specific credit card debt or mortgage or, or a title company. I'm just trying to... Throw a whole blanket thing out there for you folks to try to, to gra- try to grasp what's going on here. So, like I said, with, with me and Greg, all we were basically trying to say is make sure that the parties understand that, they, that each other have some sort of relationship between the parties. Then you make sure that, um, uh, that there's some sort of evidence of proof, and you can rely upon statutes at large. And you can, I'm not sure you could type it in, or um, I could actually send it to you folks if you guys email it to me. I could actually send you what statutes of laws means that I wrote like a little dictionary thing, and I could actually I broke it down in very plain, simple, simple terms that you folks can understand. It's called statute of fraud. So, and it comes from 1677. So, if you guys want to Google it for laughs, it's a really good one to know. Statute staples is another good one to know, but I'm not doing that right now. That has to do with the IRS, and it's 100% bona fide, and it's true, and it's dead on accurate. But right now, we just want to do statute for it because these folks want to know how to deal with going into court and out of court. Okay, the next thing that me and Greg were talking about was saying you could have um, if a representative of a fictional entity is going to represent the complaint or the claim or the, or the or breach of the contract or the debt in open court, you want to make sure that that person has a delegation of authority or a power of attorney to move the claim, like the man I... Uh, uh, the man who was talking a little earlier, I don't know if it was Chunk or Dallas, it was the man who was working in a construction company. He was giving us this great solution. I'll pay you 20 cents on a dollar, 10 cents on a dollar, 5 cents on a dollar. Well, okay, before you even start doing that, because that's insane, and I don't want to say that, before you even start doing that, you make sure that that person on a phone call talking to you has the delegation of authority to negotiate that debt. I mean, I'm unsure I could go online and I could find all kinds of people who all, all kinds of debt to everybody, and I could just start making cold calls. And I could start saying, hey, Mr. Idaho, hey, Mr. California, hey, Mr. Nebraska, uh, you owe uh, Bank of America, blah, 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 blah. And I'm here to propose an offer to you for uh, uh, five cents on a dollar. We'll wipe that out, and we'll send you all kinds of certification and verification and whatever paperwork you want us to sign, and we'll deliver, and we'll send it to you that that debt is now satisfied. Okay. That's crazy, because first you need to make sure they have an, uh, the delegation of authority. And just because they went online and they found, like, uh, like say, I wanted to go online and go to Harvard or Yale and print out a, uh, a college certificate and say, oh, look, I graduated from a master's degree from Harvard Law School. Just because I cut, copied, and pasted and I made a nice bond paper doesn't mean I actually have the accreditation to match what says on that piece of paper. So just because this man whips out this beautiful bond paper, delegation of authority, everything is stamped, signed, sealed, all kinds of nice gold fringe and all this kind of silly stuff, red borders and everything else, don't trust that piece of paper for a heartbeat. You send it over to whatever the debt collection agency or the loan department for Bank of America or Capital One, and you say, hey, have you ever heard of this guy? Because he's acting in your name. And he's stealing not only my money, but he's interfering with your right to collect on a debt. So make sure that the delegation of authority doesn't just come from the guy who claims 
to be the guy legit. He's like, oh, yeah, please. You're the legitimate guy? Yeah, please. You know what? Thank you. You know what? Uh, I just wake up yesterday. You know what? I know what I'm doing. So make sure you get the delegation of authority or the power of attorney if you're dealing with man on man. If somebody saying, well, you owe my mama money and she's in hospice care, so uh, now you're going to have to work with me. So say, okay, show me the power of attorney. Show me where she signed it. Show me. So first, then make sure you don't forget about the delegation of authority. All right, Carl, before you go too far, can I ask you a question about that? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, man. It's Dallas. Um, if, it, if Okay, let's say they do have a uh, legitimate dele delegation of authority from this person that hired them to represent them or a power of attorney. Can can the person that signed that delegation of authority or power of attorney be subpoenaed as a witness? Oh, absolutely. But like I okay. said, then you, you've got to be careful. Because subpoenas only hold basically a 100-mile range. So it's going to be interesting if you demand that they appear and they'll say, well, basically the code of, you know, wherever you live, Texas or wherever you live, is going to say that the rules of court say that you can only subpoena them from 100 miles away. Okay. But, but wait, but if you look at Jennifer Flowers versus Bill Clinton back in 1997, she subpoenaed him to appear in Arkansas District Court. He I'm tried to talk about that. Right. He tried to say, I'm in Washington, D.C., and I'm an awfully busy man. I got my finger on a nuclear button, and the Russians are about to drop a bomb on us any minute, so I'm sorry I can't make it to Arkansas at this time. It's inconvenient. You know, sorry that uh, she believes I grabbed her ass, but you know what? So what? We're talking about a national crisis. We're in the middle of a war with uh, Kosovo. You know, we're bombing all these Serbian people. We're, we're killing all these Christians. You know, we've we got to protect the world from these crazy Christians. You know, we're busy up here. I can't go to answer every claim that somebody makes in some bozo court in the middle of Arkansas or in the middle of Nebraska. Next thing I know, I'm going to have 500 people, women, claiming I grabbed their behinds. And they're all true, but what do you want me to do? Leave the presidency and go down there and answer them? The United States Supreme Court said, absolutely. If anything, you, more than anybody, since you're a public servant, you have to appear when your public calls you to serve. So... It doesn't matter you're the president. You're actually way under Jennifer Flowers. You're not above her. You're way below her. I mean, the United States Supreme Court decision was beautiful. I thought I thought they were going to tell her you're going to have to wait until he's done being the president of the United States because that office and that position is in control of the world and with the free world, and we were all dying. The economy is going to collapse, and we're all going to be uh, eaten by uh, whatever. Because the president, Bill Clinton, the leader, the, the fearless leader, is going to have to be ready to lead us to charge into battle at a minute's notice, so he doesn't have two or three weeks to waste uh, about some frivolous, well, he grabbed my behind when I was bringing up some towels to his motel room when he was the governor. You know, They're like, no, you drag your butt down there and you work this out with him. So what he actually did was he flew her up with his attorney to Washington, and they worked out a settlement that way. But see, just because you think in the... Well, the subpoena rules 100 miles. Honestly, if you want to go about the subpoena rules, look, and, and they'll say, oh, no, 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 you can't say that. This I'm just trying to tell you, Dallas, use the Jennifer Blower case. Bill Clinton said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't care if he's the president of IBM. I don't care if he's the president of Bank of America. I don't care if he's the president of the United States. If I'm going to make a claim, if he's making a claim against me or I make a claim against him, he's going to come and answer this claim. Okay, so I hope that helps a little bit answer that Yeah, question. it does. That, that's, exact, uh, that's exactly what I expected to hear because, <laughs> uh, you know, I, because I believe that there has to be a, another man, woman, there making the claim against you to make it valid. Otherwise, it's just, it, it, you know, they, they, they have no standing. So that's why I was asking, and then, I mean, you could go as far as going, well, you delegated the authority, but what personal first-hand knowledge do you have of the actual situation? Right. I'm going to get, I'm going to get Greg, I'm going to get Greg back on board. So Greg, now, remember what you were talking to me. You were saying nine, 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 nine out of ten, um, people who, nine out of ten people who are making a claim against you will not be able to validate their debt. So go ahead, Greg, and explain what that means a little bit. Are you there, Greg from Illinois? Uh, Greg from Chicago? Hey, Greg from Chicago. Greg. Hey, Greg. Are you there, Greg? Greg from Chicago. You there, Greg? Did you mute yourself? I had to mute you out because uh, we heard your burping and sneezing and everything else like that. It sounds like a cattle crossing. Hey, hey, Carl, you there? 
Yeah, Greg, Greg, I had to meet you out because it sounded like a cattle crossing, and I realized it was you and not the cattle outside. <laughs> he was sneezing at home. Um, actually, actually, it probably wasn't me at all. I'm, the only thing I'm doing is chopping up vegetables here at the kitchen sink. Yeah, something was going on. I had, this, I had to mute you out because it was hard to uh, keep a train of thought going on because it was a uh, rally. Yeah, anyway, I was, I was just talking to Mike B, and uh, he had an issue that was interesting right on his uh, – writing about this topic, and uh, so I said, hey, Mike, uh, why don't you jump on the call with us and show that in there? But what's his name? So, what's his um, ID? Uh, that... he's from, it's uh, Mike B. from Virginia. I don't know what it's going to come up under. Okay. But, um, okay, great. You know Mike. You, you know Mike from Privatist, right? All right. He's, he, I, like, I like Mike. He's a good guy. So, yeah, um, so yeah, he's he's got an issue that's kind of interesting. I think you and I talked a little bit about it earlier, and uh, he could uh, bring up a little bit more about it. It's kind of an interesting kind of like uh, man-to-man claim. So, okay, well, but, we, we, but it fits right into what we're talking about. All right, that's wonderful. We're, 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 getting, we're going along pretty good here, Greg. We've got a good steam going here. Nine out of ten people we were talking about, or nine ten, ten out of debt collectors, or nine times out of ten of these creditors who are claiming that there's a debt you, we were talking about, you said they will fail to validate the claim. Now, why do you believe that? Well, personal do experience. Yeah, do it slow. Yeah, do it slow, Greg. Why do you believe that? I believe it from personal experience. Okay, well, tell us. And the numbers of debt validation efforts that I have attempted, following their rules, following statute. You send them uh, a request for a certain information, and they send you back a computer-generated cover letter that basically says, we don't know what you're talking about. Pay us some money. And that's pretty much how the conversation goes. So what was this stuff, the information you were basically asking them to send to you? I was like, please send me proof. That this agreement exists, that that the that the amount of money that you're charging that you want me to pay is exactly what I'm supposed to pay. Show me what it was that I did or contracted to do or used. If it's a credit card, you know what did I charge? Show me that all of the fees and everything else that you've thrown onto this thing are actually valid. Show me that you didn't like add a bunch of other crap. That has nothing to do with our agreement. Show me that this is a clean, this, you know, it's kind of like if I bought a hammer from you for $10, you charged me $5 interest over six months, and then close the account, I figure I ought to pay you $15, maybe $16 for mailing, you know. And if all of a sudden you want $150 for that $10 hammer, I'd like to know where the extra $140 came from. So, let's stop right there. That's great. That's good, Greg. So, not only tell them, okay, this is what I'm saying, folks. See, because what, uh, this is what I would do if I was a credit card company. I'd say it's all in the contract. <laughs> Read the contract. It's two font. It's 10,000 pages long. I would tell them, no, highlight it. Highlight the terms and the conditions in the contract because until you do that, I think you're just making this up. I don't think there's any valid uh, explanation within that contract that could possibly legitimize what you're claiming or what, what you're what, – so please um, highlight it and send it to me. Instead of you trying to read these 10,000 pages as a – well, it's in a contract, just read it. That's not my job. No. If they see it's in there, they wrote the thing, make them bring, make them bring the law forward because that's the law. Between you and them, that's the law. So if they're saying there's a contract – and uh, you signed the thing, and you made this private law now between you and them. You have to live and die by this law. You know, you might say they're a bunch of Shylocks. That's fine. But you knew what you were dealing when you danced with the devil. You knew you were going to get burned. So, so you still got to make the devil show the terms and the conditions or the clause. They have to show it in the contract. So go ahead, Greg. What else would you ask these people to produce? Well, if we're talking about the original creditor, you don't have to worry about third-party uh authorization. If you're talking about a debt collector, <coughs> uh, we know that uh, a lot of it, now, honestly, we all know this, because, you know, let's assume that there's people on the call that are here for the first time. Um, 
what a lot of people do know is what a lot of people do know, presume, thank you for busting me on my favorite bad word. Um, all right, bad word. Um, yeah, I know, I know, it, it is, you know. You know, assume is to make an ass out of you and me, right? Um, <laughs> go ahead. All right. Um, so anyway, um, in most cases in contemporary business, when a, when a bill or a debt has been, an alleged debt has been passed from the original uh, entity to a third party, that third party has either paid those people cash, written them a check, for that debt on pennies on the dollar or agreed to a commission at a fraction of the cost, all right? And in addition to that, most of the creditors that are out there have insurance policies so that if they ever have an uncollectible debt and it goes to the third party, they actually get paid for the debt before it even goes to the third party. So. They can write it off. I mean, it's, this is gorgeous how they have this set up. They can, you can get a debt with them. They can then write it off and, and, and remove that from their profit, and they can collect the insurance on it and not have to claim that as profit because it's an insurance claim on a damage. So they get paid twice, and the third-party debt collector pays them something, so they're getting paid like maybe almost two and a half times. And they're made whole. So they're made whole, and they're coming back and telling you that they're not made whole, and you owe them this money. So you have to wonder, well, if you've been made whole, well, what am I supposed to do? If you haven't received, if you haven't been harmed or injured, and no man has been harmed or injured, and you guys, in your wisdom, created this banking system and insurance system that makes it impossible for you to lose, um, why are you bothering me? Okay. Hey, friends, why aren't you? Yeah. Stop there a second, please. All right, you're doing good. Go ahead. But what, what you folks might not have just noticed is Greg went from square dancing to tap dancing. What Greg just did is he just shifted jurisdiction. And I don't want to, I don't want to shift jurisdiction yet, Greg. I want to still concentrate okay. on, uh, just concentrate on, uh, statute. Concentrate on the law of the contract. Don't try to throw a trump card in because okay. you danced with the credit card company. So you bound yourself with the devil. You made a deal with the devil. You're going to get burned. There's no doubt about it. There's somewhere in that contract where you can get fried. So let's just work with trying to stay in honor with the person that you decided to dance with. Okay? Go ahead and keep going with that. All right. All right. So if you, if you don't know anything about what goes around behind the scenes and you think the only thing that exists is you think this credit card company actually reached into their pocket and gave you money in order to buy that refrigerator, which they didn't, but you believe that because that's what the contract looks like. Okay, the contract looks like, you know, Visa, MasterCard is going to reach into their pocket and pull out $500 for me to buy my new refrigerator. Okay, and so if you're old-fashioned farmer guy from 1800, you're thinking that's exactly what happened because back in 1800, that's the only thing that could happen. All right, there was nothing else. So... You believe it. So if you believe that, then okay, you're thinking, well, I should pay this guy back because he put his money out there to buy my refrigerator, and so he really owns my refrigerator, so I pay him off. Okay, okay. What I'm, what I'm trying to say here is, is I really don't want to uh, go down that path where because a credit card company did not give you money. A credit card company did not give you paper. A credit card company gave you what? Credit. That's right. So I don't want to hear anything about money because money is just a medium of exchange. Now, whether I trade you 300 pounds of cow manure and you give me uh, 600 pounds of uh, the best uh, Chicago block merch that you can find, that's money. So I don't want to confuse people with thinking that a credit card company gave them what did not give them money. They gave them something which they believed was worth value to them. Well, they would have never danced with these people or accepted their uh, conditions or their for value. So all I'm trying to well, say, Greg, let's I make know, this. I know you don't want to say, I, I know you don't want to say money, but but for for ninety percent of the common man, they think that that represents money. Okay. All we try all we trying to say is what things do these people, what things does the credit card company, or their representatives, or any debt, any debt, any somebody who gave you something and demands something now, you know, the restitution, what? Do 
they need to present to you or to court to keep moving that claim. Now, don't go down on money. Don't do any of this other nonsense. We're just doing a generalization for anybody who owes you a debt, that believes you owe them a debt. What do they need to establish? Anybody, well, anybody who wants to move anything through a court has got to bring the law and the facts. Okay. Now, we're not talking about that. When I said to you before, what we were doing was like saying, how do they validate and make to produce the facts and the evidence to move the court? That's the question. You said 90% of them can't produce, and they can never be able to validate the debt. Now, what? how would you say they need to bring forth to validate the debt? They need to bring forth a man or a woman who knows that this is true. Okay. Now, stop right there a second, folks. You know, this is this is where this Greg just did his jurisdiction change on me again. Okay? This is common law. Okay? Now, in contract, if you made a deal with Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola does not have to bring any man or woman forward to bring forth because you reduced your status of a man. And you merged it with a fiction. So, for you to get something of value from a two-dimensional world, you reduced your status to that of a two-dimensional entity as well. So, they are going to demand from you, this two-dimensional entity is going to say, well, you know, we demand from your person what we, what we agreed as a medium of exchange, money, or what we deemed had value. We are going to give you 10,000 cases of Coca-Cola, and you're going to give us... 10,000 widgets or $10,000. So this is how they're going to bring you into court. Now, can you play the old Trump card and say, oh, well, this is common law land, and you know what, I'm going to beat these Coca-Cola out of every damn Coca-Cola can they sold to me. They sold me 10 million Coca-Cola cans, so I'm going to beat them out of their money, and I'm going to say, ha, there's nobody with any first-hand knowledge that could say that that signature on that piece of paper between me and Coca-Cola is legitimate. You know what, honestly, Technically, yes, you people can do it. Do I think it's disgusting and evil? Yes. And you're worse than a lawyer to me because you know how to take advantage, how to take candy out of a baby's mouth. Because, like, say Greg had a company, and he just decided to make his own new cola company in Chicago. And Greg had a whole bunch of stockholders, like his mom and Mike from Privatist and everybody joining in and giving Greg money to build up this wonderful corporation. So Greg created a corporate entity. I come along called because I know common law. I'm going to order 10 million cans of Greg Cola. So I get Greg's Coca-Cola coming to me. I tell Greg, ha, prove that's my signature. Prove this, prove that, prove this, ha, ha, ha. You're screwed. Is Cola wind up with 10 million cans of free soda? Absolutely. What happened to all those stockholders? What happened to his, his mom and everybody invested in that corporation? They trusted me that I would do a certain thing for certain, or a return for something. So now, what's happening now is it's been going along so smoothly for the corporations to keep doing this to people. All people have to do, what Greg would have to do then, as a good businessman would say, Carl, honestly, uh, this stuff is going to get wacky. You guys are starting to drag us into common law. You guys are starting to do this to us. We're losing uh, exponentially. We're, we're going downhill fast. So now, we're going to have to slow this process down. So, Carl, if you want $10 million of great Coca-Cola out of the great Coca-Cola corporation, Carl, we're going to need a $10 million bond. So that way, if your check bounces or anything happens between the transaction between you and the dragon common law, we're holding your freaking bond. So you're going to sign this $10 million over to the corporation known as Greg Coca-Cola. Okay? Now, what I'm saying to you folks, this is what's going to happen. It's, it's commerce is just going to slow down because the corporation is going to say, how do we get somebody to use their debit card or credit card or sign a mortgage without making sure they're bonded. Because everybody just did it on their word. You'd have a credit rating. And your credit rating just established, based upon your acts in the past, your inactions in the past, how good your word was to paying off a debt. So if they just say, look, everybody's learning how to beat us, you know what? Either they're just going to all wrap up shop, or the, 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 the banks and everybody's just going to wrap up shop and say, look, uh, like there's only one pre one person out of a hundred on this planet that lives in the United States. You know what? We're going to take. We're going to go to China. We're going to go to India. We're going to Africa, where there's 99 percent of the world lives. We don't need you, United States anymore. You know what? You guys figure out how to trade rubles or or, or, or wampum or, or she shells with each other anymore. You don't want to deal with us anymore. You don't want to act honorably with us anymore. We're not going to deal with this bond nonsense with you people. You know what? God bless you. We're going to unbolt all your machines and factories, and we're just shipping them to China, and you guys could just work in McDonald's for the rest of your lives. 
because we're not going to extend credit to you people anymore. How hard is it to get a loan nowadays? It's almost impossible. How hard is it to start a business any day? Because the banks are scared that they're not going to get be able to, you could say, screw over the people anymore. So they're afraid that these people are going to learn how to get out of any kind of credit card debt or any kind of loan or any kind of mortgage, and the people will learn how to do it. But then what are we going to have? So this is what I'm just saying to folks. You know, be careful. You know, you guys are going to get what you wish for. You know, but what's going to happen to the next generation? The people who try to establish credit or get homes or try to get businesses going. That's why I say it's so important to, if you want to play in their jurisdiction, if you want to play in their two-dimensional world, believe me, if the best you could do, like I say to you folks all the time, is say, look, by my word, in good faith, the best I could do, I'm out of a job right now. Greg, the best I could do right now is give you $2 a day for the next 365 days, whatever, until I pay the debt off. Believe me, as soon as I get back on my feet, as soon as I get a job, as soon as I win the lottery, believe me, you will be the second person that gets paid off. You know, of course, I'm going to say, you know, praise to Jesus, whatever. But you're going to be the very next person I want to pay off. And there you go. So this is what I try to say to folks. You know, uh, Greg's going to bring you down to a second jurisdiction, common law, and how to wipe out these people and get them off your back. But um, if so many people do it, like I said, it's going to be a domino effect. And it's going to be a house of cards, and it's going to collapse. So I'm just, this is just my belief. You know, this is what I really believe I can see happening. So uh, if you want to play in the two-dimensional land or three-dimensional land or, you know, that's fine. But, um, well, but actually, uh, Carl, if, Carl, if you think about it, though, I'm sorry for jumping in. No, you are running, man. Um, but at the same time, you know, two different, two different bad things happen. One, people start feeling entitled. And two, banks decided to really go berserk on usury. If you really stop and think about the fact that the prime lending rate right now from the Fed to the banks is 0.1%. Just about nothing. Right? The banks get printed money for free. Then they charge you 18 to 21% interest on borrowing. They are at a point right now where their profit margins are obscene. It is absolute, you know, gun to your head usury. All right? So both what happened is that instead of everybody being in the middle and being honorable, the people became more and more dishonorable, and the banks became more and more dishonorable to the point where the the chasm between the providers of currency and the users of currency is so wide right now that it's unresolvable. And your your prediction of having a new economy and a new form of currency and everything like that, I think that that's inevitable. I think that the game that was set up, I personally think the game that was set up is at an end. Okay? I don't think it can go, it can't go very much longer. And if it does, it can only be done at the point of a bayonet. And um, I think that there will be a new uh, development of currency. I think that in the short term, it's going to go back to what everybody can trust, and that is straight barter. I'm a plumber, or I know how to do plumbing. I'm going to fix your sink, and you're going to give me a bushel of corn. And a lot of that stuff is already going on outside of the, the large metropolitan areas. If you go into Iowa and Nebraska, you know, southern Illinois, Indiana, throughout the heartland, I don't know how things are on the coasts because I'm not familiar with the internal economy that I, I know my 10, 12 states over here, and a lot of people are doing that now. And it's all hush-hush because nobody wants to talk about it because they all still are afraid of the IRS. And so a lot of people are just doing that, you know. And it's all being done on a handshake and a nod, and, you know, they're trusting their neighbors, and their neighbors are coming through. And that kind of stuff is really happening. And that's, yeah, how, or, that's how ordinary folks in the heartland are dealing with the problem. But believe they're it or not. Basically opting out. They're just opting out. Believe it or not, and it's funny, too, the reason why the banks don't want to loan money is because the interest rates are so low. And it, to them, they're waiting for the interest rates to rise. To, uh, to, you know, start loaning money out again. So well, only on, 
So, oh, but Carl, be be clear on that. Only on secured loans. Right. The interest, they are they are under they are under a lot of scrutiny when it comes to a secured loan with a collateral, but they have no scrutiny when it comes to credit cards, and that's why they push everybody to credit cards. Well, what I'm saying is they could do what, whatever they want. What I'm saying is like you know venture capitalists. Venture capitalists they're sitting on their money and they're just waiting for the interest rates to go up. So people might be like they're saying that these corporations and these college institutes are sitting on billions of dollars just waiting for the interest rates to go up so they can put the money back into the economy. But at this point, they said, you know what, it's better for us to stick our money under our mattress than to put it in an economy that might go under. So until they actually see that people are borrowing again, because borrowing means growth. Borrowing means there's, there's corporations starting up and there's a, a demand for currency. There's a demand to spend again. So like George Bush said to you guys after 9-11, don't let the don't let the terrorists win. Go out to those malls and keep buying products and keep buying Nintendos and keep buying houses. Just keep the money. Just keep the economy going. Don't be afraid to go out of your house. Don't be afraid to go to the shopping mall. Go out there and spend, spend, spend. So as long as right. see that there's a demand for the currency, the interest rates will go up. And so if the venture capitalists, you know, people who might be millions or millionaires or billionaires, will feel a little less hesitant to putting money back into the stock market or putting it into their local communities if they believe there's going to be real growth. But until they believe there's real growth again, they're just going to buy bullion of silver or, or gold ingots, and they're going to uh, stick it under their mattress and just wait for the economy to collapse. So, uh, like I said, that's why I just try to say, everybody, you know, if everybody just starts to learn to keep their word and play fair and square, you know, I, I just think this is the way to more go at it than try to figure out how, who's going to screw the other side first. Are, the, are we going to screw the banks or the banks going to screw us? Who's going to do – whose turn is it to screw who now?